Thank you very much, Kirill. So, uh, so yeah, we are continuing. Uh, so yesterday we have stopped on the place where we're discussing the asymmetric laminates. So just to go briefly to the same place where we were. Uh, so we were analyzing the dispersion relation and we found that uh, there is uh, there are two ways of looking at one is looking into cutoff frequencies and another is looking at well setting omega to zero so trying to find uh, the uh, point corresponding to the slowly decaying boundary layer so that was this graph here so without contrast uh well the this point here well this is the exact solution so the this point here is corresponding to uh, a static limit uh, associated with the uh, boundary lay, but this boundary lay is relatively rapidly decaying here. And these two points here, K, B, L, and omega shear, are the approximate values of the, um, well, this boundary value uh, wave number and the um, cutoff frequency. See, clearly, because there is virtually no contrast, the, the approximate results do not work very well. However, when we have contrast, they do appear exactly where they should be. And the trouble with that is that in case of high contrast, this uh, boundary layer, well, the, 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 decay, the decaying boundary layer is really reasonably small, uh, so, sorry, slow. So, so therefore it's really hard to see, uh, there is this usual understanding that the boundary layer will decay rapidly and then it is the outer solution. But in this case, it is a problem. And that is why uh, before people used to not like this problem really, because they were never sure where the boundary layer would stop decay. Yeah, so we found a slightly uh, different approach to this uh, to this problem, really. Uh, okay, so and uh, I think this was the last slide we were discussing yesterday. So the asymptotic uh, approximation of the dispersion curves uh, seems to be working well for the two first modes, and this is where we stopped yesterday. So. Um, Okay, so in principle, uh, I'm not showing the details here, but uh, following the same idea that I presented yesterday for a symmetric geometric structure. So for an asymmetric case, it is also possible to derive the asymptotic equations of motion. And here they are, so you can see for two modes. So the first one, if you think about it, so this H1 plus H3, if uh, well that's that's it's a sort of well inertial term so this is an anti-plane equation of motion uh well loading on the right hand side though so this is the one that is coming from the stiff components and you can see that this capital u is just average displacement right but there is another one uh the another the additional one is presented in the form of the angle of rotation phi so there are two equations like that. One interesting thing to point out, which appears uh, within this asymptotic procedure when we do it, is that the leading order, the leading order uh, behavior of the displacement is again reminding us of the problem with the rods. So the 1D problem is absolutely essential. So we can see the features in a high dimensional problem further and further again. So uh, the stiff components, which are here one and three, the displacements there are independent of the thickness yeah, of the transverse variable. So again, it is a kind of a rigid body motion that we have seen being a constant uh, um, constant profile of for the stiff components and for the softer one well there is this linear one associated with the almost homogeneous deformation so again this analogy with the rod is particularly useful right so now one more thing is that as the important well i would say it's probably the biggest challenge that we've had with all this is how to properly formulate the boundary conditions because with this asymptotic equation of motion, basically what we do is we are taking the whole laminate and trying to replace it by some two dimension, by some uh, you know lower dimensional model. Uh, 
But then what do you do if you have, say, a semi-infinite structure like that, and there was some load applied to the boundary? How would this load be transformed to a lower dimension? So this is one of the most uh, delicate problems in uh, uh, elasticity. And so I am giving some details here. Uh, so say if we, well, the problem is, has been uh, considered now. So this is the final result that we have. So if there was a semi-infinite strip uh, and we would have some loading applied at the edge, uh, so this capital P of X2 and T, so it could, it, it is uh, in assumption that it, there is a slow dependence on time to be fair, because it is a modification of the, well, it's generalization of the Saint-Venant's principle. And uh, this, uh, this uh, principle is usually formulated in statics. So we can, all, we can extend it slightly to low frequency dynamic, but if we wanted to do it more carefully, well, then we would need to go into some refinements, and these are really, really challenging. In fact, even for a single layer, uh, there has just appeared a paper by Maria Wilder uh, from Saratov with uh, co-author in Mathematics and Mechanics of Solids. It's quite an, a seminal paper, I would say, just appeared in 2022. Uh, so, so we are not going to refine it. We're just formulating the leading order uh, boundary conditions here. So they are the following. So this is the first boundary condition, uh, basically being the classical one. So it is corresponding to the usual understanding on this, of the Saint-Minan's principle is that if you would have as if you apply a self-equilibrated load at the end, then uh, the consequences of that would decay fast enough. So for any class of self equilibrated load. So that was, that was sort of expectable, but we also needed another boundary condition because we had two modes there in the long, uh, in the long wave low frequency region. So we needed an additional condition. So the first is formulated in terms of the stress resultant. The second, well, for the stiff uh, components, the second is, is formulated in the form of uh, stress uh, couple for the softer, uh, for the softer components. So here is the formula for G here, and that is the boundary can well the second boundary condition. So that means that now uh, the the problem will be well is reduced so we are talking about uh, the lower dimensional model and these would be the appropriate boundary conditions uh, they could also be verified by uh, looking as well there is an approach through integral transforms and they are basically uh, the second condition would be would correspond to uh, vanishing the contribution of an associated pole corresponding with a slow decaying boundary layer. So more details can be found in that paper, uh, but I think it's, uh, it would be enough to just give an overview here. Okay, so now I think that we have covered everything that I wanted to say about uh, scalar problems. So it's time to move to vector problems of elasticity and see how the methodology is developed there. Okay, so uh, just a few of the preliminary remarks. So the classical rayleigh lamb dispersion relation for a single layered plate in case of anti-symmetric motion is derived like that. So it's a usual dispersion relation for a layer with three uh, faces, an infinite layer of thickness H. And uh, so uh, I don't think there is a need to present a derivation of that, uh, but the typical, dispersion diagram looks like that. So it would combine the cut or the fundamental mode here and uh, the harmonics, the higher frequency. Uh, so usually we would be interested in uh, these domains where the approximate theories can be constructed. So the long wave low frequency domain here uh, and uh, the long wave high frequency domain there. So that would be in the vicinity of the cutoff frequencies. And what we can immediately see here is that, well, these two 
uh, modes are quite far from each other. So in a, in a way, there is no chance of having any two mode approximations here because basically they would appear if this uh, second mode was close to it. And it will be the case for the high contrast media as we have seen from previous consideration of a scalar problem, right? So, so these, uh, in case of a <clears throat> long wave low frequency approximation, uh, we would have uh, quadratic dispersion and uh, this, uh, this part of the dispersion curve well, if we make this quadratic approximation here, that would be really the Kirchhoff plate theory. So it would be valid only here near zero. Uh, then there would be also long wave high frequency theories, which were derived by Julius uh, and his co-authors, well, starting from the 90s really. And uh, that would provide uh, asymptotic theories for the vicinity of the cutoff frequencies. And typically the approximation would be something like that. So you can guess from there, there will be a, a hyperbolic equation, uh, well, the model equation governing this approximation. Uh, right. So yeah, I'm just putting a reference to Julius's book here before we move on. Uh, there, so although uh, there is no chance of getting uh, two mode approximations, there are still some known cont contributions where they actually try to combine the low frequency and high frequency into a single equation. So typically how they can do it. So they originate from a number of engineering ad hoc theory theories. And uh, then this would be composite non-uniform plate theories. So that would mean that uh, if I return back to this, it would be working in the vicinity, well, for small wave numbers. So it would be working somewhere here and also somewhere there. So these two regions united together, that would be the aim of it. But there would certainly be a gap, a huge gap in uh, frequency uh, where this will be uh, completely invalid. So this will be the composite uh, plate theories and some relevant references are provided here. Okay, so now if we start looking at our three-layered laminate, but now we are thinking not in terms of anti-plane, but actually plane strain motion. So that is now a vector problem of elasticity. Uh, we have the standard uh, equations of motion and the boundary and continuity conditions. So say we take three, uh, faces there, and on the interfaces, we want to have continuity in uh, uh, displacements and the two associated uh, stress components. So the structure is chosen to be symmetric just for the ease of algebraic uh, computation, because even such a structure leads you to a six by six determinant as a dispersion relation. Well, that has been done. Uh, it looks like Yuri Anatolyevich Ustinov from Rostov was the first who did it in 1976. There were some other publications as well. And uh, as you can see, this is a much more complicated dispersion relation compared to the standard one that we had for uh, Rayleigh lamps. So although this had transcendental function, at least you can look at it, you can deal with it somehow. With the new one for three led, it's really hard to do anything, uh, to see anything in it. So it certainly does make sense to analyze it asymptotically. So there's all sorts of hyperbolic functions involved. Capital K as usual is the uh, wave number, the scaled wave number, omega would be the scaled uh, frequency. And all these quantities are various functions here. So we want to have a uh, small parameter, which is a relation of the shear moduli, uh, similar to what we had for the antiplane problem as well. Okay, so now, uh, not surprisingly, because we have been prepared for the antiplane case, we can see that if there is no contrast, the dispersion curves look 
similar to the so usual Rayleigh really lamp dispersion diagram. So we can uh, see similar type of behavior. However, if we try to do uh, effect of contrast, so if uh, the ratio of stiffness becomes uh, small, then the second mode is getting very close to the first one. And we, we may also as, as see from the previous analysis, roughly speaking, we would always have well, starting from the rods and then uh, having the antiplane problem of elasticity, our scaling for lambda squared, the spectral parameter, was starting with epsilon. So basically, uh, this uh, cut of frequency, the small cut of frequency, is of order of root of epsilon. That's what we can see in our theory. So, so clearly, the, as I was telling you, for the uh, for the um, um, photovoltaic panels, uh, this ratio could be approaching 10 to the power minus five. This root of that could be really small. Yeah, and that means, of course, the interaction between the two modes, uh, additional coupling appearance and so on. So all sorts of complications may arise from here. And certainly uh, if somebody tried to use the uh, standard uh, Kirchhoff type model here, uh, it would clearly not be adequate. Okay, so definitely we do need some special uh, two mode models for here. And also uh, you can see that actually uh, this is indeed a two mode. So starting from this value of say roughly 0.17 for the frequency, uh, if we have this frequency, we have two modes working together, both acting in the long wave regions. So the model would be, must be working in the long wave region. Yeah. So in order to start uh, analysis, first we look at the problem for the cutoff. And for the cutoff, we just need to take this uh, cross-sectional fiber. And if we take a cross-sectional fiber from there, that brings us back to the problem for a rod, really, that we were considering on the very first day. And uh, remember, we had that frequency equation of the format of tan something times tan something equals something small. This is the analog that we have here uh, for a fiber. Uh, but now uh, the solutions for omega, uh, well, the small solutions would be associated with a small cutoff frequency for the three layered structure, composite structure. And uh, of course, we can derive a condition for the first shear cutoff frequency to be small, and that's this condition here. So the ratio of densities, ratio of thicknesses, and ratio of stiffnesses are all involved. And now the question is that, you know, well, I've already mentioned that this omega would be of order roughly a square root of epsilon. Uh, there, well, there would be many possibilities for these strong inequalities to hold. However, what we tried is to have a look at several, uh, several applications that would inspire some kind of scenarios, uh, scalings that would satisfy these strong inequalities. So uh, the photovoltaic panels was one of them. So when the ratio of stiffness is well, so that we have a, a stiff uh, two uh, skin layers and they are relatively thick. So the ratio of thickness is of order one. So we have a soft inner layer and the ratio of densities is of the same order as the ratio of stiffness. So stiff skin layers and light core layers. Uh, now, another option to look at would be laminated glass. So uh, in case of laminated glass, we would have uh, thick uh, stiff skin layers and there'll be a light thin core layer, right? So, so the ratio, so you can th think about the ratio of volumes here being roughly order one, whereas here the ratio of volumes is certainly very different. So the stiff, there is a lot of stiff component in this uh, structure. And uh, the opposite, the sandwich structure, uh, which will include uh, uh, stiff thin skin layers and light uh, thick core layers, right? So this 
three structures. So in principle, there was a fourth one appearing in that paper that was also inspired by some uh, filter, uh, gas filters. But in reality, um, they are somewhat similar. Well, the outcome is somewhat similar to sandwich structures. So the asymptotic behavior is quite similar. But these three are different because we can see that roughly speaking here, the volume of the, there is really not a lot of the uh, stiff volume, then this is comparable between both. And this is the case where there's a lot more stiff volume compared to the, uh, to the light one. Okay, so for all of these three scenarios, they all satisfy the previous conditions. So these strong inequalities are satisfied for all three, but clearly these are all three different types of structures, different classes. So we will expect to see different uh, behavior. And indeed we will that uh, for all of them, we will need a special theory to be derived. Okay, so before we do that, we just, uh, as usually, we would expand the dispersion relation in Taylor series around the origin in uh, uh, wave number and the uh, frequency. And uh, then basically these coefficients, gamma one, gamma two, etc., they are involving all these ratios of densities, lengths, and stiffnesses. And then the question is, depending on the scaling, so depending on the scenario, uh, we will have different orders. So we would know which ones we need to neglect, which ones we need to take on board. And so we really need to perform this multi-parametric analysis, but that turns out to be, well, potentially leading to difficult problems with Newton polyhedra. So actually uh, with, within our approach, we only uh, look at a particular scenario, say case A, B or C that I have been showing in the previous uh, slide and uh, we deal with that. So say if we're looking at the first scenario of having stiff skin layers and light core layer, but the relation, well, the ratio of thicknesses is of order one. And then we have the following. So actually we need to retain uh, five terms, five terms uh, in order to balance it. And this actually describes, well, captures two modes of the dispersion uh, relation. So this is how this approximation works. So you can see that this uh, dotted line here is the approximation and solid black line is the exact solution. So that seems to be working well. Now, this could also be split uh, to several local approximations. So we would potentially be interested, say, only in the vicinity of the origin or only in the vicinity of the cutoff frequency or on the vicinity uh, of the cutoff frequency, but on the second, on, on the fundamental mode, right? So these three vicinities could provide us with various particular cases. And uh, in case of the vicinity of zero, we can see that if we were to keep only the first two terms, that would be the classical Kirchhoff type theory, then it would not work well at all. Yeah, because really we are expecting uh, th that the approximation should be working in the lone wave low frequency limit. So say for K equals to 0.1 or 0.2, we would expect the approximation to be really, really close. But as you can see, even here, this red line showing this two-term approximation uh, is already getting sufficiently far away and further on, so it just misses the trick completely. So in order to uh, balance it, well, we need to add this uh, approximation of the higher frequencies, uh, which appears in the vicinity of the shear cutoffs or somewhere here. And we actually need to join them together and if we do that, then we have something like that, which, well, the four term approximation is working well. And now it is uh, uh, covering 
a wider range, well, the expected range uh, of the long wave low frequency uh, limit. Uh, so that's just uh, one result that we have here. And one more thing we can say that this is certainly a uniform approximation now, so that works quite well. Now we can also come up with a near shear cutoff approximation here, but you can already see there is a slight difference here. So really this is a, uh, because we were originating in our approach from the Taylor expansion in the vicinity of the origin. So this is not the classical uh, long wave high frequency approximation where this was centered around uh, the cutoff frequency. But this approximation is centered around zero. And this is why certainly it does work, but uh, you can see there is a discrepancy, some discrepancy here uh, near the cutoff frequency. Right, so that's another particular case. Uh, now, another another scenario is a laminated glass. So, well, inspired by laminated glass. Uh, I already mentioned on the first lecture that uh, in 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 if we wanted to make it slightly closer to reality, we would really need to consider the inner core layer to be composed of polymer. So that means. Uh, adding viscosity, and that means adding some time dependence to the constitutive relations, which will uh, sophisticate things a lot, to be honest. Well, we are having this in plan, but uh, did not start with it yet. There are other things as well. So uh, if we do the similar thing here, what we will find out is um, the there is also a uniform approximation here. In some way, it looks even better than the uh, previous type, uh, the previous case that we considered. And uh, you can see that uh, the gradient is actually smaller here. Yeah, so, so well, actually you can see that uh, omega uh, round one uh, corresponds to k of at most 0.04. So really the gradient is very, very uh, small here. And that is the reason why the approximation works very well. Right, so here is the corresponding uh, five term approximation of the dispersion relation. Well, it took Luther some time to deal with these fractions, but that's, that, that's life really. Uh, okay, and then one more, uh, the sandwich structure, uh, the situation is very different compared to the previous two. So what we see here is that although the cutoff frequency is small, but the gradient is relatively high. And as a result, uh, the curves are moving steep uh, high and uh, there is a gap in frequency that the model doesn't cover. So this is not a uniform approximation. So if we, so say in the previous case, if we wanted to move an increase in the frequency, you would come up to this point from which you would have a two mode approximation. So there'll be two modes excited at the same time and it will be going on and on. So uh, the third mode would not really appear because it's somewhere there. So it's not already the long wave low frequency limit. But in case of a sandwich structure, uh, well, we go increasing the frequency and then there is this gap. So the, st the theory becomes invalid because uh, it uh, gets outside of the long wave uh, region. So that is only a composite theory. Uh, and uh, still you can, you can do it in principle. So this will be the corresponding approximation of the dispersion relation. Okay. So uh, again, like for the first case, we can come up with some local approximations. So uh, approximation of the fundamental mode and approximation of this uh, the first harmonic, but there will always be a gap for this case. And uh, well, there's nothing we can do about it really. Okay, so there is no overlap bridge. Now, the next question that we have asked ourselves as ourselves is, uh, can we actually look at this transition process? So how does this uniform approximation becomes a composite one? And it became very clear that of course, it does depend on the gradient of the curves. 
and that means it, it is it is linked to uh, the fraction of stiff component that we have. So basically, how stiff is the structure? Because as soon as it as it loses certain uh, critical number of stiffness, then it becomes a composite approximation. So it loses uniformity. And uh, uh, well, for that, uh, that was linked to our um, work with Slovenian partners. Uh, so and became part of the impact case that we were submitting to the last uh, research axon framework. So people from UK would know that ref is, is still a big word there in the universities. So, uh, so uh, that was a, uh, an application to the project they've had on developing lightweight uh, car parts. So on the one hand, uh, the, you want to make your car with the relatively light uh, parts, but on the other hand, clearly that might create uh, various unwanted resonance phenomena. And so you have to find a balance. And so uh, obviously we were not involved in development of any new car parts. However, we have attended a couple of workshops uh, together with Julius in Slovenia, where we were presenting our result for finding a, for presenting a simple formula for finding the eigenfrequencies, uh, which they could use. And uh, uh, their chief of research and development was reasonably happy about that because uh, he was describing this as a method for the boss, basically, because he could compute and get a rough estimate very quickly, whereas some of his, uh, um, some of his uh, colleagues could do work for some time with finite elements and then get the certainly more precise result, but uh, he could have this estimate before and could definitely validate whether this was right or not. So uh, in this case, what we did, so we, we have rearranged the perturbation procedure slightly. So instead of starting from the ratio of stiffnesses, we started from the ratio of densities because that was mainly for the lightweight, uh, within the lightweight framework, uh, but still the procedure was quite similar. And uh, so as a result, we found this value of one third, which is a limiting case basically. So A would be this relation. Uh, so yeah, that's the exponent here. So the ratio between the uh, mass density uh, and the, thickness. So A of one third turned out to be the critical value. And we can see that if A is uh, less than one third somewhere here, then we had uh, this uniform behavior. If uh, A was greater than one third, we were clearly observing a gap. And A associated one third the sort of close vicinities is uh, some transition zone there. And we have also derived the corresponding two mode uniform approximation and the two mode uh, composite approximation of the dispersion relation. Right, so now, uh, because we have had these um, approximations for the dispersion curves, we can already, um, did use, well, not justify yet, but we can certainly guess uh, the types of lower dimensional PDEs that would be governing um, motion of such structures. So uh, that would be corresponding to the first scenario inspired by photovoltaic panels. Uh, so certainly if you can, if you'll take the Fourier and Laplace transforms of these, you will get to the approximate uh, approximation of the dispersion, uh, uh, dispersion relation. So you can see a uh, sixth order really. And then uh, for the composite one, it is also of sixth order, but uh, no, it's for fourth order actually, but very, very different. And uh, so then the next question that will naturally appear is, okay, that is for the infinite uh, 
uh, structure. What happens if we even make it semi-infinite? So if we had an edge and we wanted to perform, to formulate the boundary condition. Well, uh, this is uh, still some work in progress. So I was able to show you uh, our progress for anti-plane for scalar setup, but not for, for vector yet. It would require some more technical work there, but I think we will do it eventually. Uh, okay, so now one more thing that I wanted to uh, share here, well, seems slightly unrelated, but in fact it is related, because there is also contrast there, which leads to the small uh, sort of a cut of frequency. So that is a problem that we were considering together uh, with our PhD student Leila Sultanova some time ago, and that was for really type waves in case of a uh, coated half space with a clamped surface. So we know that uh, really waves uh, on counties, on, on, well, usually are uh, usually existing within the Neumann type boundary conditions. And uh, if the surface is clamped, then it would have no effect on wave. So there'll be no way for the wave to propagate. There will simply be no uh, possible decaying solutions. Uh, however, uh, if the layer, if the coating layer is very soft, then certainly it's not too bad because what will happen is that this soft coating uh, will not really prevent a lot of motions for the uh, stiffer substrate. So the substrate could still move. Well, at least in order we may expect it will be a sort of a rigid body motion. And this uh, soft component would just be taking all of the information. And that was inspired by the work of Kirill and Shane some time ago. So if we formulate the problem, so the usual uh, half space with a coating, and we want to have a clamped surface there, writing down the equations of motion, the Hooke's law and uh, the boundary conditions. So this, uh, this surface is clamped, no displacements there. And it continuity conditions here. So we want the displacements and stresses to be continuous. And then uh, for the dispersion relation, well, I don't think we need to write it because it'll be uh, quite a, a massive equation, but we can definitely look at the graph of the dispersion curves because they are quite interesting. So uh, what we see is that, well, the, there is, it seems to be starting from zero, but it's not. In reality, if we magnify this region here, we see that there is still a domain here uh, where there is no wave. So this uh, plays a role of the cutoff frequency, starting from which waves start in propagate. So, and you can see that this cutoff frequency is really small. And that is, again, the effect of contrast. So if we wanted to reduce contrast, then certainly this wave, the first the, the first point from which it starts would be moving away from zero. Uh, there are also uh, this kind of asymptotes in the vicinity of which we don't seem to have any, uh, any uh, waves propagating. And these are associated with the thickness resonances of this soft layer. So if the soft layer is not resonating, then everything is fine, the wave may propagate. However, in the vicinity of this resonant frequencies, then the uh, wave propagation uh, stops. And uh, just like, well, we also uh, took, uh, we took uh, into consideration well, a um, sort of auxiliary problem for that was an anti-plane formulation. So that would be a love type wave, uh, which was, um, uh, also with, with this uh, uh, clamped surface. And there was a relatively similar diagram that was slightly simpler than that one. This seems to be slightly more complicated. So we can see here that these dispersion, uh, dispersion curves, they start on, their, uh, on this gray line. So these are the red dots shown here. So the, red, the, the gray line is associated with a shear wavefront. Then they, they tend to be going very closely along this red 
well, or pink dotted line. So this pink dotted line is corresponding to the Rayleigh wave front, uh, in, of course, in the substrate. So you can see that, well, it started there, then it moves for some time very closely along this Rayleigh wave front, and then it just blows up, right? So that's the feature that we are uh, observing here. Okay, so now uh, just some uh, of some uh, reflections and comments on what we have covered in this uh, three lectures. So first of all, uh, one thing that I did not mention here, uh, the case of high contrast also appears to be a uh, to, uh, to be delivering very nice results, even in the static problems for coated elastic cuspids. So I'm presenting two papers here containing the full classification. And it was a very interesting thing because basically when you have a coating on top of the half space and say, if your coating is much uh, softer compared to the substrate, the usual expectation of what people are doing in engineering communities, they are thinking, okay, well, that means it would be Winkler-type behavior. And they apply the Winkler hypothesis without really justifying. But it turned out that you can't just say it if it is much stiffer because there, there need to be an, uh, some kind of an estimate. So how much stiffer? So there are two small parameters there. So one small parameter associated with the thickness of the coating and another small parameter coming from the ratio of stiffnesses. So these two parameters need to be related. And when we related them, we were able to say exactly what should be the uh, what should be the range of these two parameters allowing Winkler behavior, say at leading order, allowing Winkler behavior at leading order and character, and so on. And so what happens? Uh, so so we, made to, we managed to find that actually in case of these two parameters being exactly equal, so uh, funnily enough, the Winkler behavior was not the case even at leading order. So so that again shows the beauty of asymptotic approach. And on the other extreme, you could also consider the case where your uh, coating is actually much stiffer than the substrate. So the substrate is sloped. In this case, you would expect it behaving like, say if you take a metal plate and put it on a soft jelly or something. So really it would be the the, the, the coaching would take the most, uh, well, will be defined in the behavior. So, so in the case of a high contrast, you would have a, a Kirchhoff plate uh, limit there. So, uh, so now maybe say a few more words about the future plans that we could have in this area. So I said already about boundary conditions for these vector problems in elasticity, because these uh, higher order PDEs definitely need some refined boundary conditions. So say if you look at uh, this sixth order PDE that we have here for uniformly asymptotic behavior, uh, uh, clearly if somebody tries just the two standard boundary conditions for the layer, this wouldn't be sufficient. So you definitely need the third extra condition and this uh, other two may need proper just justification anyway. So, so this is, uh, something that we should bear in mind always, in fact, when we try to refine the equation, because it is often the case that people are trying to refine the equation, say, of a Kirchhoff plate or something. Uh, so take on board more sophisticated parameters, get a higher order equation of motion, but they never think that if they increase the order, uh, they need some additional boundary conditions if, you, if they want a finite structure and that undermines the, uh, the results completely. So unless we really uh, treat the boundary conditions properly, uh, we cannot uh, be happy. So another thing that I've been mentioned already is uh, to account for viscosity in soft components. So that's also something we are planning to do in the future. Um, uh, mainly all of these results 
that we were presenting were focused around this local low frequency, uh, around global low frequency behavior. So our dispersion relation would typically involve ton of omega or omega times something, and we would usually as well assume all the arguments of the stun functions to be small. Uh, however, uh, we were demonstrated in case of a rods in the simplest possible that there is certainly a scope for analyzing local low frequency behavior where the polynomial approximation is only possible for the part of the structure and some other components uh, cannot be approximated like that. So the uh, frequent, the high, relatively high frequency behavior there. So that is also something to uh, potentially do. And finally, I wanted to mention also uh, possible extensions to curvature to some strong homogeneous uh, shells, maybe uh, more multi-layered shells and so on. Uh, so to conclude, um, so here are some conclusions. So first of all, the effect of high contrast often leads to uh, extra low uh, spectrum that would not be uh, otherwise if the structure was more homogeneous. Uh, and uh, the, the problem that as soon as we have multi-component structures, we have a lot of parameters to think about and possible uh, several small parameters that needs to be related and so on. So a proper multi-parametric analysis is uh, crucial for success there. And uh, one more thing to mention is that because there is a known similarity between long wave behavior of thin structures and uh, uh, homogenization procedure for periodic structures. Certainly these results that we will be de deriving for layered structures will have their uh, analogs in the world of periodic structures. Okay, and I think I do, I, this is all I wanted to say and I just wanted to advertise a course that we are running on uh, this uh, st uh, strongly homogeneous multi-component and multi-layered structures in October in Udine. Okay, I think that's all from me for today. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure uh, to deliver these uh, lectures. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>